So uh, good morning. Hope to uh, keep what's been a you know really interesting conference moving along on, a, on another interesting path. So we've sort of set the table for this panel. So we've had this uh, deep look into uh, how Wall Street looks at things. And now we'll have a deep look into the sort of uh, policy intersection of uh, law and economics and some policy considerations. So uh, I'm Dean Brenner. I'm the Senior Vice President of Government Affairs for Qualcomm. If you don't know Qualcomm, we're the world's, one of the world's largest uh, developers of wireless technology. Sorry, I had to do that ad. And I'm also a, a Duke uh, alum, but more importantly, a Duke parent. So I have a little bit of an investment here to keep this thing going. Um, and our, we have a great panel here today. We have uh, Joel Waldvogel from the University of uh, Minnesota, John Rogovin, who's the general counsel of Warner Brothers, and Christopher Yu from University of Pennsylvania Law School. So we'll kick it right off with uh, Joel with some interesting insights uh, starting right there. Thanks. Well, thanks very much. This is a, a, a well-dressed crowd compared to the people I usually talk to, <laughs> economists and students. All right, let's see if I can make this work. So usually, you know, uh, the task here was to come and talk about broadly about digitization and media industries, and usually such talks are really tales of woe, you know, with pictures like that, pictures of recorded music revenue that's just been plummeting, and if I were to, if I had the picture, the, you know, the newspaper industry revenue has been plummeting, and so there are just terrible tales of woe. Uh, but uh, in video, um, uh, there are some obstacles to more revenue. I mean, so for example, there's a lot of talk about piracy, and particularly piracy in, in, in you know, other countries. There's also uh, just uh, regulatory obstacles like import quotas. So China will come up a few times in my, in my discussion, although it won't be the, the main point. Um, but the reality in video is really far less depressing than the reality in a lot of these other industries, like music especially. Um, you know, if you, if you look at revenue, the sorts of revenue that are easy to observe for, uh, for, uh, uh, for video. Uh, there's substantial growth, for example, in box office revenue to US origin movies. So that's what this is. This is uh, billions of dollars uh, of revenue, worldwide revenue to US origin movies. It's a little hard to put these numbers together, but not too hard. And you see that it's been growing, you know, in a period when revenue in music was going the opposite direction, just really plummeting. And this doesn't count the revenue sources, really important revenue sources that we can't see, like the streaming revenue, the, the home video, the television, the pay, you know, uh, pay television. So uh, I, I think we're not really talking about tales of woe as the big backdrop here. Yeah. In fact, it's not just that revenue has been, uh, has been rising. There's also been some other things going on, which is that costs have fallen in pretty substantial ways. I mean, uh, there's been a, a really enormous growth in the production of new movies, or the you know the number of new movies made, as well as television shows. I don't know if you can see this. I can't see it on my screen, but you can. What this is just this is just time series of the number of movies produced by year, as reflected in movies that have a, a listing at IMDb. So the four pictures in that diagram are U.S. Uh, features, U.S. documentaries, and world features and world documentaries by vintage of original. Uh, I, I don't want to say release, but by vintage of production. And what you can see is there's been just an enormous increase, particularly since about 2005. Okay? Now, of course, these aren't all movies you really want to see. Most of them are movies you can't see, and I'll talk a bit more about that. But certainly, there's been a, a great growth in output, which is not what you would expect in an industry uh, that, say, it had declines in revenue, which this one hasn't. But if you dig a little deeper into that, there hasn't been any increase in the sort of big release, wide release movies. The movies that are uh, produced by Motion Picture Association of America studio members, those hover around 150, 200 a year and actually have been declining lately. And that's the, the lower numbers in this, uh, in this graph. The higher upper level numbers in this graph are the total movies released into US theaters. That's a number that's gotten up to around 550, 600, some number like that, because there are a lot of movies released in limited ways, very limited ways sometimes, in order then really just to be reviewed and distributed through other kinds of platforms. Okay, so the, that, that huge growth in production, I didn't mention the numbers, but back there a few slides ago, I'm, we're talking about 7,000 movies produced per year in recent years in the US, features plus documentaries whereas about 600 are making their way into theaters. And that's still, you know, pretty, that's growth relative to 10 years ago. But, you know, if you think about other avenues of distribution, uh, so look at the year 2010. 
And if you were asking how many movies uh, were distributed via various channels of distribution, about 550 in US theaters. But if you were to look today, how many such movies were at, available at Google Play from that vintage? It would be 620. How many at Vudu? That's Walmart's instant streaming platform, about 811. How many at Amazon Instant? 1,648. I mean, think about that. That's three times the number that appeared in movies and about, oh, almost 10 times the number of sort of the big movies that one tends to think about when one thinks about movies. Now, uh, <clears throat> I guess we all know, as it's come up in everybody's discussion, there's this really big growth in, uh, in, in digital distribution platforms. And there's a, a wide range of models. Um, you know, on the one hand, we have you know, curated platforms like Netflix, curated in the sense that they have a relatively small number of, of products, not that they necessarily have the most high value products. Uh, and, and Comcast and HBO are kind of the curated model. And then there are these open, much more open models like Amazon Instant, where they have literally, I think it's 30, well, it depends which source you look at, but it's on the order of 30 or 40,000 different titles available. Uh, that, that's, that's kind of, kind of amazing. Actually, uh, I couldn't sleep last night, and so I thought I would, I would try to find the data on the following question. So the question is, if you look at all the different platforms, over-the-top platforms, through which one can watch movies, the question is, how many are on each platform? And then beyond that, how many of the titles on each platform are only on that platform and not on any other platform? So I had some fun finding the logos of all these platforms. <laughs> Uh, I won't make you wait for all of them, but there it is in maroon and gold, which, by the way, are University of Minnesota colors. <laughs> but <clears throat> you can see that at the left, you have the Amazon, uh, Amazon Instant, again, about 32,000 titles in total, followed by Xbox, Voodoo, iTunes on the order of 16,000. And it follows, you know, it follows substantially. You know, the HBO Now, which is a very high-value service, has very few titles. But the other interesting thing here, maybe the more interesting thing, is the gold part of the total bar, which is the exclusive content, the content that's only available on that platform. And a number of these platforms have very little of it. Um, Amazon has quite a lot. Now, when I say exclusive, it's not clear to me that no one else has the right to be selling that. It's just that it's not available on any other platform. So I don't want to say that it's exclusive in the sense that no one else could sell it. But certainly, they're more differentiated in the sense that they have a bunch of stuff other folks don't have. You know, the other one down farther down the, the list there, Fandor, which I had never even heard of, is one that specializes in indie movies. So the, the fact that it has a large fraction that's non-duplicated or exclusive to it makes a lot of sense because it has a lot of indie stuff. All right. Um, so I, I was supposed to talk a little bit about sort of role of government and challenges going forward. And in some ways, the message here is that because of these reductions in cost and the growth and the ways to distribute, in some ways we're living in, a, in a, not only a golden age of production, but in a golden age of distribution as well. And it's, it's a little bit hard to find problems, but I think it is, it, is, it is possible, with a little bit of effort, to find some problems and reasons for Washington to exist. So, you know, the question of China and will China open up, I think remains a big question. You know, as you probably know, China only lets in, now it's, I think it's 34 movies a year from elsewhere in the world. Um, and it, it's risen from 20 a few years ago, and which has had a big effect. You know, China, by the way, spending four and a half billion at the box office last year compared to one tenth of that five years ago. So this is a big deal. This is a big deal, the question of China. And uh, I think it'll be a big deal not only for total revenue, but also potentially for the mix of products that get produced around the world. But another question, more in line with things we've been talking about today, is the question of distribution platforms. And will any of them or some of them emerge as bottlenecks? Right now, it looks like there are quite a lot of them with lots of content. But I, I, I would, uh, you know, if I were in Washington, I think I would want to keep an eye on this. Um, not that it's illegal to have, illegal, you know, uh, exclusive content or, or whatever, attractive, uh, attractive distribution channels. But still, this is something I'd want to keep an eye on to wonder whether it may emerge as a problem. And a final point, a little bit self-serving for an academic, but maybe not, is the data availability issue. You know, it's, it's kind of hard to study a lot of these industries. Uh, if the data aren't expensive, the, 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 that's a little problem. The bigger problem is non-existence. I mean, so a lot of these, who knows how many times people have watched particular movies on Netflix? Well, I don't. Uh, and it's not publicly released. Who knows about video on demand revenue? Essentially nobody except for the owners of the properties. We just don't know what's going on in these parts of the market. Um, so these increasingly important revenue sources are really not observable. I mean, what we can see, the growth in production is in, in some sense great news. So if industries were asking for relief because they're suffering, uh, I guess it would be probably sensible to say, show us a little bit of evidence. Uh, in fact, maybe evidence should be kind of a, a cost of admission to go pleading for uh, 
regulatory relief. But just to, uh, to finish up, we are definitely living in interesting times, but in contrast to the subtext of that usual quote, it's not necessarily cursed. I think it may be, it doesn't mean we have to be cursed. Okay, thanks. So next we'll have John, and by the way, I short, short of John's introduction, John is also former general counsel of the FCC. Well, thanks very much. Um, uh, it's a real pleasure to uh, be here um, uh, with you all, with uh, Stuart, my old friend, and uh, I've even gotten to see my mom. So that's a, that's a good trip from Los Angeles to Washington, D.C. So, um, you know, I, I um, uh, really uh, welcome the discussion. It's, a, it's an incredibly interesting topic. You know, when is regulation uh, needed? And for us at Warner Brothers, it's not a theoretical question. It really boils down to will this uh, help or impair our ability to produce uh, the greatest content? And uh, just a quick word on us at Warner Brothers. Uh, as you may or may not know, uh, we are the number one film and TV studio in the world, and we have a film library of over 6,000 titles. We've been in the film business since the 1920s, and we're rather consistently either one or two in box office. Um, uh, another aspect of Warner Brothers that people don't know as well and as not as familiar is our television side. Uh, we are um, the largest uh, producer of television uh, programming. We have 70 shows uh, on the air uh, this year. Eight, 18 of them are for uh, cable, either basic or premium, and uh, as well as uh, SVOD. So um, on the uh, SVOD uh, front, we have two that were in production for Netflix and one for uh, Hulu. We're doing um, uh, Stephen King's book, 112263 for Hulu. Um, so uh, when, you, uh, when you look at um, you know, sort of what we're doing, we're also part of uh, the Time Warner family, which includes Tom, uh, HBO and Turner. And collectively, we are investing um, $10 billion a year in programming, which is a very major investment. And uh, it's part of our commitment to create the best, the most compelling um, uh, stories and have them ubiquitously distributed uh, around the world over all platforms. Uh, we're producing all of this in a rapidly changing environment, which everybody has talked about today. Um, just focusing on the television side for a second, um, today there are almost uh, 325 scripted uh, shows, uh, which is almost double from where it was five years ago. That's 24 on over-the-top uh, platforms, 180 on cable, both basic and premium, and about 115 on broadcast. That's a lot of programming. It's a lot of shows. No one in this room could possibly uh, keep up with all those shows. And, uh, you know, I think all of us have had that, um, uh, that uh, phenomenon where somebody says, you've got to watch uh, some show, and, you know, you've never really even heard of it. There's so much stuff out there, and uh, Joel and others have uh, correctly identified this as the golden age uh, of, uh, of television. Um, there are um, uh, more outlets uh, than ever before, and that's been, a, I know, a consistent theme of, uh, of today. Obviously, the broadcast networks continue to thrive. Uh, there's the traditional pay TV, which we've talked about. There's the emergence of the new skinny bundles, uh, which is, um, uh, you know, over uh, uh, distribution paths like uh, PlayStation, Sling, Apple TV, and Verizon, and that's a brand new uh, phenomenon. Obviously, the main SVOD players, Netflix, Hulu, and Amazon. There's also the existing brands that we're now seeing going uh, a la carte, like HBO Now and Showtime. And then there are the targeted SVOD players, uh, which um, there are a lot of them, uh, many of which uh, may or may not be familiar to people in the room. Um, services like Drama Fever, which focuses on Korean programming. Crunchyroll, which is uh, anime. Uh, Rooster Teeth, uh, which is games. The only one that I really didn't have to go up and look up what it was was MLB.TV. Uh, <laughs> I was pretty sure I knew what that one was. And uh, there's Shudder uh, by AMC, which is horror, and uh, W, which is uh, sports. Um, and then lastly, I would mention the MCNs, uh, uh, the uh, YouTube, Machinima, Awesomeness, Maker, Full Screen, Style House. It's just uh, uh, unbelievable, the amount of programming. 
that's uh, less traditional programming, but um, you know, no less, uh, no less watched. Uh, you know, if you look at the top seven channels uh, now, uh, Netflix, Facebook, and YouTube are three of the top seven. And I think that says it all in terms of the diversity of programming, the different kinds of programming. And um, you know, programming is no longer just about watching major tentpole movies, although we encourage everyone to go watch. Um, but there's just a, a wide um, a variety of it uh, over, uh, uh, obviously, lots of different devices, tablets, smartphones, and, um, and all of that. So um, in, the, in the sort of face of all that, you know, where, where are we on all this? And where are we on the issue of regulation and how the market is working? And it's rather simple for us. We're agnostic. Uh, we're happy to sell to innovators. We're happy to sell to incumbents. We're not tied to a distribution platform. The only thing we're truly committed to is uh, creating the best content uh, and making sure that we have the relationships with the best talent and uh, creating compelling stories, high production value, and uh, we're prepared to make you know, billions of dollars of investment. And the only thing that we ask in return is uh, that we get a fair return uh, so we can keep creating the content and respect for our copyright. Um, I guess the last thing I would say is innovation is not new to us. Uh, it, we're at Warner Brothers a Studio that's proud to have invented sound for movies. We were, a, it's in our DNA. We were a significant driver in the creation of the DVD. We have a significant driver in the creation of the ultraviolet um, uh, system to allow for streaming and downloading to your devices uh, over multiple platforms. Uh, uh, a significant driver for TV everywhere, which allows you, if you're authenticated on a, a, cable, uh, on a pay TV platform, to get your content anywhere. And we're routinely now selling uh, to Amazon, Netflix, Apple, Facebook, all the OTT providers. So um, to return to the question that uh, we're here to talk about, which is what's the role for regulation, I think in the uh, sort of face of this rather overwhelming uh, you know, record of um, you know, a golden age of television, programming uh, uh, available over multiple devices, I think um, you know, there's really, uh, it, it would be unnecessary at this time, and uh, I don't see anything in the foreseeable future um, that uh, would, um, would make regulation, uh, uh, you know, a, a sort of compelling need. Um, and so uh, I, I think it's uh, particularly true in this sort of uncertain and rapidly changing environment. I think that's particularly challenging for regulators to try and uh, keep up with that and uh, runs the risk of artificially cutting off uh, business plans. So um, that's my perspective from Warner Brothers. Great. Thanks very much. So this is so far an awful lot of good news. So I'll make, uh, in contrast, the usual Washington panel. Christopher, can you, can you keep this going? Uh, I think so. I mean, as, as Joel said, oh, sorry. Joel said it's opportunities, and opportunities uh, can be good news, they can be bad news, and we all like to think society progresses onwards and upwards, but that's not always the case. And one of the interesting things that we face is, is how we do things and take advantage of the opportunities matters a great deal. So one of the interesting things, you know, one of the charges we have in this panel is to be forward-looking, and um, I plan on sketching out what I think of some economic changes in the marketplace, which I think are, out, are on the horizon that are real and have a chance to change the way we do things. But before I start looking forward, <clears throat> I thought I'd spend a, a moment looking backwards as some of the, uh, as we're looking back in terms of data. And I started to think about um, what we were worried about in the year 2000. Uh, around 2000, the big issue in the communication space was the AOL Time Warner merger. Uh, back then, we thought access to AOL keywords was the essential platform that gives access to the entire internet. And at, normally, at this point, I put a snarky comment in about uh, how many billions of dollars of shareholder value was destroyed by that merger, but out of deference to John, I will forego <laughs> giving you the exact number. Um, and then the other thing we were worried about was the media ownership proceedings, which were eventually challenged and struck down by the Third Circuit. We were having hearings all over the country, protesters, hundreds of people. At this point, those proceedings are still ongoing, and I know some of the people, my friends in the room, are working on this. Uh, let's just say that the, uh, the steam has, the air has definitely gone out of that balloon. Uh, 
I mean, at this point, whether a local broadcast station will be allowed to cross own a radio station or a newspaper or how many, doesn't really matter anymore. You know, I mean, at this point, broadcast is in decline, um, and in fact, this is just, uh, it's remarkable. It seems quaint that we uh, ha expended so much time and energy over how those ownerships were held. So what's fascinating to me is, I say those things um, just to give us a little humility about our ability to predict what's going to go on. And uh, what I find, just to jump to the, the, what I hope you take away from this, is people sometimes, when confronted with one future reality, say with great confidence, oh, that's not gonna happen. Um, I don't think we're that smart. I, it's not that, I don't think anyone's that smart. So if we were that smart, when we saw the iPhone come out in 2004, we'd understand that we're getting a fundamental transformation about how people are gonna experience the internet. And that, in fact, right now, all of us have a certain bias in the sense that we all follow. I, I, I see so many laptops in this room <clears throat> that it's because we, as policy people, we are generators of content. We are, we are tied to our keyboards. Most of the places I go that don't involve policy people and academics, you can't find a laptop. I feel, quaint, I feel out of touch with reality because I have my old laptop up. If most of the people are consumers of content, and for that, devices like tablets, and uh, handhelds are brilliant devices. Second, when you get the tablets, even after the iPhone revolution, Apple made fun of the big phablets and these things, like who would want to carry around this thing? Even the smart guys at Apple just blew that. And now you see iPhone was saying, why are you making this Samsung Note? And if you looked at the form factor, the latest iPhone is blowing up too. So I mean, even the people who are very good about this have a very hard time understanding what's going on. So um, we've already seen some of the things John's talked about. A bunch of things that we said would never happen in this space have already happened. You know, I never believed when these things came out that people would watch video on a form factor that small. Um, we're, I was clearly wrong. We, we were told skinny bundles would never happen. Uh, channels going OTT would never happen. All these things would never happen. Some of them are. And whether they play out or not, we'll see. So what are the new ideas I'm starting to think about? So one of the interesting things to me about the modern video OTT distribution world is it is, represents, for the first time, the most successful moves away from advertising-supported internet services. Uh, you know, the, the leaders and initially Google, Facebook, all these things essentially depended on advertising support. What we see in, some, in the leading OTT video models, such as Netflix, they pay. Users pay and you don't really have the stream of advertising. So what's fascinating to me is there is a lost literature, economic literature on, from the broadcast era that suggests that this shift may be a very, very good thing. Is that in fact one of the economic problems with advertising support is instead of being able to show how much you like a program by paying more for it, you basically have a flat response because it's how much you buy of the advertised product. And unless you're going to go out and say, oh, they advertise whatever, Charmin bathroom tissue, I'm going to go keep that program going by buying a ton of that. It's just not going to work. It's like, you know, I always joke to my students, it's like keeping a, a flight that you really like and it's really important to you on a route by going to the Sky Mall magazine and buying a lot of product. I mean, it's just not a very good way to signal intensity of preferences. For the economists in the room, it basically turns into a voting scheme and we have all the problems and that are associated with that. And it's pretty clear there's old research going back to the broadcast days that advertising support generates about one seventh the, uh, the amount that direct pricing would give. And that, in fact, it radically understates the intensity of preferences and supports worse programming as a result. And so what's interesting is um, I, I think that this also, the other problem with advertising support is it's introduced an intermediary and their business model preferences into the, to the choice about what programming you get. Uh, one of my favorite stories comes from the 70s, shortly after Roe v. Wade, uh, both NBC and HBO produced movie-long features on Roe v. Wade. Uh, NBC faced a, uh, the, the advertisers that were supporting the program were facing consumer boycotts from people who were animated about this politically. Uh, NBC essentially showed that, ended up showing the movie without commercials at a total loss of the production costs. Uh, HBO showed it without any controversy and didn't bat an eye. And the president of HBO said very casually, he said, Candidly, it's like, I'm not any braver than my counterpart at NBC. My business model is just different. And that way, instead of having the intermediary of an advertiser determining what gets shown, the, 
individual viewers could find my small programming that's intensely preferred they can pay for or even controversial programming. And what's interesting is that, in fact, I think the shift away from advertising support has a lot of interesting things in terms of the business model it makes available and potentially benefits for consumers. Uh, the second thing is the growing importance of wireless. Uh, what's fascinating to me is I always look back and I remember with great confidence that people declared in the early days of the wireless voice industry that wireless cell phones are simply a complementary service that will never replace fixed line voice. Uh, we were wrong. Um, the voices, uh, fixed line voice is in decline uh, and those revenues pretty much are never coming back. And that's not a bad thing. I mean, it's a fantastic product. Um, what we see is that um, people used to think you wouldn't watch on these little devices. I'll give you some numbers uh, from about, these are about a year or more old, but apparently 11% of US households rely entirely on a wireless connection for their broadband. Uh, the biggest country in the world that I know of is Austria. At that point, it's 24%. It's become so large that the Austrian regulator now treats wireless and fixed broadband as being in the same product market because there's enough substitution between the two. So what's interesting about uh, wireless is there's a skepticism about whether it can ever deliver enough volume. Uh, one of the conversations that was given earlier, uh, Jason is saying, he's, is there enough spectrum and can we get enough uh, service to make this go? Um, I'm reminded of one of the very first plays, which was Metro PCS in the early days, actually did something really heroic. There, the, now, Metro PCS had what, I think 3%, 5% of the national market was actually enriching the space. Well, Bill Baer was talking about the importance of keeping four players. Well, um, Metro PCS is one of the fifth players that's present in many regional markets that make that more diverse. They took an old 1G platform of 1.4 megahertz of spectrum and deployed LTE. And included in that, they were able to provide video primarily through YouTube. They did it because they realized that you do not need HD quality on your smartphone. And so you use something called real-time streaming protocol to strip out the resolution, lower the resolution levels to something appropriate to your phone. And they were able to pump out video on 1.4 megahertz of spectrum. So I'm not saying that, you know, as I, the humility in me says, I don't know that that's the answer, but the funny thing is beyond what we've learned is that there are alternatives to network costs. We can use storage. If you can pre-position stuff on your device and use local storage, overnight you could double the amount of spectrum, you, the programming you get, just by offloading it into your storage. We've learned from CDNs, pre-positioning things closer in the network to you can reduce latency, can do different things. And that we have a tendency to think of these things as separate markets, that is devices and networking and so forth, and the actual uh, data center worlds. In fact, they're deeply interconnected and are substitutes for each other. And the companies, the people like, uh, it's like uh, Warner Brothers, they don't really care which technology you use to get there. That's an endogenous choice for them back. They want the best way to deliver high quality content to customers. And they are, as we've seen with DVRs and all these things, very innovative ways to make that happen. And so um, I think it's even just looking at the spectrum crunch in terms of the ability to take advantage of video is too narrow. We need to think more broadly because I think there are more technological solutions out there that people have experimented with. And I think that's pretty exciting. The third thing that's sort of interesting to me is how much the bargaining dynamics have fundamentally changed. You know, we used to have a fairly small number of content producers and a fairly small number of content outlets. And we used to worry about, you know, I mean, going back to the old network antiquity days, you know, we only had three networks, how to get four back in the 80s, and so, uh, the cable was the only MVBD platform, and how do you reach? And the record industry complained that how dependent they were on the radio industry for marketing their products. And we got used to a regulatory regime and a way of framing pro uh, pro policy issues as being very tight, fisted, hard-nosed bargain between these highly concentrated industries. I think that's going by the wayside. What we're starting to see is, in terms of sources of content, a much broader array, and uh, there are things that are finding audiences that are, we never conceived of before. What we're seeing is a, a broader number of distribution channels and a lot more options. And in fact, the presence of alternative options to get there puts a limit price on what anyone can charge you. Because you now say, well, uh, you want X, my second best alternative is Y. Uh, maybe you'll pay a little bit more of the value to this person, but if you have alternatives, it just uh, fundamentally changes the dynamics. Um, there's, for example, uh, when we talked about it in terms of the various cable mergers, there was a tendency to take the old world of retransmission consent and the negotiations of the ways people reached could, uh, could reach consumers and translate it over to the OTT world. 
Now, what we've learned is the typical uh, MB cable company, and I'll use Comcast just because they're the largest, and this is when we have the most, most data. Um, apparently, there are actually 50 pairing arrangements in the Comcast and 8,000 transit arrangements in the Comcast. And so when you actually look back at the choice of a, of a negotiation between someone trying to reach, if they can't use one avenue in, that is their transit partner has a peering relationship with them, in fact, you have to take advantage, to look at the entire set of choices that they have, including CDNs, including direct interconnection, and look at all these other things before you can really understand the bargaining dynamics. Because then we have a much richer world, and what we discover is networks have this weird quality of like balloons. You squeeze one in, they tend to bulge out someplace else. And that, in fact, understanding them as systems and not as one-off bilateral negotiations is important to understanding how this is all going to go. So in, what I would say is, uh, and to close is just, I, I guess what the, the implications of the regulatory humility that we have and the changes we have is that, in fact, uh, make sure that we don't reflexively say, oh, that'll never work or I don't believe that. I mean, we've been proven wrong often enough to know that we probably need to keep an open mind. And you know, the best, I think, business planners will sit there and say, look, I don't believe that's likely to happen, but if even there's a five or 10% chance it may go a different direction, it's time to develop some contingency plans and start to think more broadly about what might happen if that reality came true. And I think that automatically that mindset will make things a lot better. On the regulation side, I think we also have to keep in mind that uh, we have to allow room for flexibility and experimentation. I mean, it, my biggest plea is to think always about structuring regulations that don't mandate a particular business model or a particular business arrangement, but really try to open it up. And in fact, one of the interesting things is um, that's not to say that if problems develop and are shown on data, um, you can go ahead and remediate problems where consumers are harmed. What I guess I'm concerned about is broad prophylactic regulation on contingent possibilities. That may never come true. And in fact, if we take those and make them too important, put too much emphasis on them, we may lose a lot of <coughs> experimentation in ways that I think have enriched the video environment in important ways. Great, thanks a lot. So, so far we're setting a record here for a very uh, happy and um, non-contentious panel. So let me just uh, give Joel and John an opportunity. Is there anything that anyone has, on the panel has said that you want to express uh, agreement, disagreement, uh, emphasize, or react to? I, I thought the last point uh, that you made is, is, is so spot on. You know, it's really impossible to look into a crystal ball and see where the markets are going to develop. It's rapidly changing, and there is a real risk that you could cut off an a exciting business model that somebody's got cooking up in their uh, garage. I mean, that's really how it's working these days. And um, uh, so I, I, uh, I sort of heartily endorse uh, that perspective. It uh, doesn't mean that there isn't a role um, you know, in certain areas, but I think as a, as a broad general matter in the topic that we're discussing, I think um, uh, light touch, humility, whatever you want to call it, is in, uh, very much in order. Joel? Let's see, in the, in the hopes of provoking a little bit of discussion, at least. Uh, so I actually do, I do think we're living in great times, but it is kind of hard to know what's going on. I mean, we, we don't have anybody here who's complaining that there's a disaster. And often policy gets you know, initiated by somebody saying, we're suffering, we need relief. I don't hear any of that here today. But as I think as policymakers or watchdogs or observers of, of the scene, we need to have some data to actually know what's going on. And it's actually pretty hard. It's pretty hard to know what's going on. So the, the, the hope of creating controversy is to say, how about industry? Well, how about either government lightly compel, encourage, or industry voluntarily share real data so we can know what's happening? I mean, again, we don't know how, how much of any of these things are being uh, consumed. And I guess we could just say it's not a problem since nobody's loudly complaining. But I think we maybe should do a little better than that. I guess I, w I, guess I would say, um, it, you know, in response, um, you know, one of the things that's very observable is what's happening in the dynamic between uh, innovators and incumbents. And that, you know, those two poles uh, often drive a lot of the debates, particularly at places like the FCC and elsewhere. Um, and uh, I think we're seeing an explosion of innovation, you know, and so the, I think the proof is in the pudding that with all this innovation, uh, innovators uh, seem to be having a, a good time of it and, and bringing on new services and um, uh, satisfying uh, consumer demand and creating content that and making content available that consumers want. Can I quibble with one piece of nomenclature you used, John, which is 
I'm not sure I'm comfortable with the idea of thinking about innovators and incumbents anymore. Um, in fact, what we're seeing, uh, Google has potentially lumped in the innovator stack. It's not clear that they are regarded as belonging in that role by certainly EU regulators and other places. Um, I would say Netflix has generally been regarded as an innovator, and as Jason pointed out, if you've watched their stock price, I mean, they really have on a, on a roller coaster ride from you know, what I remember, like 14, 15 billion market cap down to about one or two, now up to 25, 30. I mean, and from taking real risks, I mean, they have. But, you know, people are talking now, and one of the moves that people are going to Hulu is that they're a player. You know, and at this point, they're the established platform, and people are worried about installed base and giving them reinforcing, you know, sort of a market position. I don't think that those labels always help us in the sense that it, it casts a role in the dynamics. What we see are just some new moves, but I actually sometimes think the so called innovator is often in the more is, has strength to its bargaining position in ways that those words might shield. Okay, I have lots of, I can ask some questions, but why don't we open it up, Stuart? Um, does anyone in the audience have a question? Quick question. First of all, thank you all for coming, and great, great event, uh, Stuart, uh, again. Uh, so uh, some of you touched on this briefly, but I wanted to drill down. The, the Assistant Attorney General is here this morning to give the keynote and uh, focused a lot on perceived gatekeepers for uh, distribution of, of content. I wanted to get your sort of reaction, your view of um, what is that potential? Is there a uh, concentration of market power that's resulting in consumer harm? Should the government be, be doing something there or not? So, I mean, um, what, what the classic antitrust analysis has now looked at is we have to worry. I think that the real focus is often on market share. Uh, we've learned that that's probably wrong. Uh, in a rapidly growing market, what you care not about is the current market share, but the market shares that you're going to get. And if there's new customers coming in, it's not who has current customers, it's what their position to capture future ones. We've also learned from contestable market theory and other things, the real issue is entry barriers. Um, is that, you know, you can have markets that look very funny, but if entry barriers are very, very low, we shouldn't really care about gatekeepers because any attempt to take advantage of that just disappear. And so the interesting question in that sense is you look at the stack of video distribution, you know, where are the, the problems? And in fact, historically, for the vast majority of entertainment programming, the, the factors of production for new entertainment programming are plentiful and extremely competitive. So that is cameras, directors, actors, you know, these sorts of things. There's never been more video produced than ever. That's easy. Uh, potential watchouts have historically been things like sports, where you're not going to see those same sorts of factors coming in, and there's a limitation because of the way things are. Second, it's not a national market. They tend to be regional markets, which tend to can create regional monopolies because then you can't have these things coming in. What I'm blown away by is uh, the, the import of uh, soccer leagues into modern programming, which is, you know, NBC Sports has put in the English Premier League, uh, Fox Sports is countering by bringing in Bundesliga, which has been the best league in the world for a long time and none of us watch it. La Liga's coming in, you know, all these other things. And in fact, the U.S. has been lagging in interest in these and they're starting to generate audiences. And so that's fascinating to me. The other side in terms of the network, the, the, the rest of the chain, um, we got to think about distribution through the networks, the different parts, CDNs, local distribution. I actually think to the extent to, you know, a lot of the program, the problems are focused on creating competition up here. I think there's a lot more issues that we have to think about here that are very diverse. And then devices. And in fact, what we have is, is uh, a bunch of people concerned about that. But frankly, I think that the entry barriers to networking have never, and certain core networking have always been considered to be fairly low. And if wireless ends up being an important place, then that market will become more workably competitive than we've ever had. Uh, the interesting thing to me is uh, what we're going to see in devices. We have three radically different business models being pursued by two and a half-ish companies, uh, depending on how effective you think Windows Phone is as a competitor in this space. Um, and uh, what I would say that they are actually innovating in tremendous ways about how to redo that stack, not so much the thing that keeps striking me is, for example, Android is an open source platform uh, that allows, right now a bunch of Chinese companies are bypassing the rest of the Google apps and deploying phones, and Samsung is trying to develop Tizen, which is its own operating system. And so what we're seeing is actually a fair amount of movement there, too, in a ways that are very uncertain. So I... 
If anything, I'd be, might be concerned about the handset just because of the actual dynamics. But in fact, with the entry barriers there being so low, I'm not sure I'm even concerned there. Other audience questions? <laughs> well, let, let me ask this. So can we trace the fact that it's the golden age of television and that there's so much uh, production and all these great things? There's so much going on, we can't even keep track of it all. Can we trace any of that to a policy? Or is this more... Uh, what I like to say, there's the Washington world and then there's everywhere else, and everywhere else is just uh, moving ahead in all sorts of socially beneficial ways that those of us who live in Washington are sort of not, are, are just sort of trying to catch up with. I think this is uh, <clears throat> technological change that, that's made it possible. I mean, it's, it's digitization has made it cheaper to produce music, books, movies, made it cheaper to distribute music, books, movies, and so it's just reduced barriers to entry to almost nothing. It's not to say that there aren't still some scarce resources. You know, Brad Pitt, there's only one of him. But uh, there's just a lot, uh, a, 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 it's much easier to get into these businesses and to sell things. One, one thing, though, I wanted to say, and, and Chris, Christopher, you, you, you made this uh, funny comment about, you know, AOL, AOL keywords. You know, the essential facilities of a generation ago are kind of amusing to us today. So let me go ahead and embarrass myself 20 years hence by saying, if you think about the, the, the ch one of the challenges here, one of the evidences of possible challenge, the essential facility of 2014 was ha Taylor Swift, right? Because she pulled herself off of, uh, uh, of Spotify. And uh, I, I agree with you that it looks like we have uh, ease of entry, but I still would like regulators to keep an eye on the platforms to see if, if maybe there's some tipping. One can certainly imagine mechanisms that would lead to indirect network effects. I don't see it happening yet, but uh, you know, Regulators are here, they might as well do some, some work, collect some data. I, I guess I would point to two, two things. Uh, one, I think the FCC has done a very good job in getting uh, Spectrum out uh, through the auction process. Uh, not always perfect, and there's some bumps in the road, but I think um, a real effort has been made to deploy a Spectrum, which is obviously critical, and that comes uh, from a regulatory initiative. I think the second is um, a light uh, regulatory touch uh, over uh, uh, broadband issues, which I think uh, left um, uh, uh, the cable plant owners and uh, the telcos in a position where they felt comfortable putting fiber in the ground, which was a, um, an investment they made knowing uh, they had the backing of Wall Street. And I think uh, there are regulatory policies that help promote that kind of environment. And all that broadband is, uh, we're yielding the benefit of that today, I think. I just wanted to emphasize what something Joel said earlier. In the last comment was talking about distribution getting cheaper. He said in his main presentation, production has gotten a lot cheaper. It is hard to underestimate how cheap it has become. The digital, digital technologies have made filming and editing movies. Um, filming, you can, you know, at dinner last night, Joel said you used to pay a quarter of a million dollars for a movie quality camera. For $2,000, you can make a good movie on a camera. But not only that, the editing costs apparently used to cut physical film was time consuming, expensive, and required a very rare skill. Digital editing is so much cheaper. You don't have to repurpose now. It's in a digital format for film and for, you know, projection film and for video. It's just made everything drop to the floor. And that is a big part of why we're seeing so much. Okay, so let me ask one other question then. So there's kind of a policy elephant in the room, right? So uh, John is saying that uh, correctly, I, in my opinion, that the auction process has been you know, really a, a, a model for the rest of the world, for the wireless industry in the United States, and that a light touch on broadband policy has created this multiplicity of um, distribution outlets for John's company and others to take advantage of the shrinking costs that digitization has allowed. Okay, so there's this uh, monster called Title II, right? So is that something that the three of you worry about as somehow impacting video, uh, all these positives that you see in the video marketplace, or is that something that's less relevant? I'm just a Hollywood guy. I don't know what Title II is. <laughs> <Yeah>! <laughs> so, okay, Christopher knows. So what th th the experience I've had is, you know, and uh, so I started, I started teaching as a media law professor and uh, talking about media ownership. And so I, this really is a very strange thing to me. The net heads and the bell heads have been butting head for, for 20 years. 
And I think the, the, the net heads have had the better of almost every single one of these fights on a consistent basis. This is the one moment where I actually think the net heads would benefit from a bunch of bellhead thinking, which is if you look at what was in front of the commission in the 80s to 90s, it was talking about de-tariffing, getting rid of Title II. And if you read the economic literature, starting with Averich and Johnson through, there's a certain romanticism we have, some people have in the space about Title II. If you read in the 80s and 90s, we didn't think it worked that well. You know, we said that there, it's inflationary, it, 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 it coordinates cartels, it curbs innovation, and all these other things. Those critiques have not gone away. And if we're going to think about how to do this, we've got to go back and look at that literature. I've heard the chairman say a bunch of times, it's not public utility regulation, it's not ex ante prices. Actually, if you look at the way we had morphed tariffing back then, it was pretty much you posted prices, you had the right to do them right away, and if the commission objected, they could do it after the fact. And so it's actually remarkably similar to what that was, that we actually spent a lot of time and energy both out of NTIA and FCC saying this isn't working very well. And so what I would say is before we do, as we think about how that gets implemented, make sure we don't lose the lessons of the past in this respect, because that was a problem. There's one other issue that I get frustrated with, which is people say, we've been talking about network neutrality for 10 years. And I just realized that I actually have some fault here. I actually wrote the second article on network neutrality. Uh, Tim Rue wrote the first one in 2003 in Phil Weiser's journal. They asked me to write a response in 2004 at the next conference. And this is before anyone cared about it, and he wrote a reply to me. I'll take responsibility for getting it started. I will not take responsibility for keeping it going as long as it has. <laughs> but what struck me is not, the thing that is not old is interconnection. People treat this as, oh, this is well tried. That is something that is new in this debate within the last year. And it's very, very badly, you know, not well thought out and discussed in the same sort of way. And if you start talking about t Title II and interconnect, it has the prospect of going to interconnection as well, uh, clearly it is a matter of jurisdiction. And that, when you're talking about re making prices in a network that is currently governed by 40,000 independent networks that interconnect through bilateral arm's length negotiations, and then going and regulating individual prices within that space, and certainly some of them are outside the jurisdiction of any regulatory agency in the, in the US. If you get one of those prices wrong, if you set it too high, all of a sudden the natural thing is, is to have uh, an adjustment and have the prices adjust. If you set it too low, that link will get flooded with a bunch of content that is not, doesn't have, and you can't have the price correction to let it, to bring the things back into balance. And so in a system that is a network where it can actually reroute flows through different ways to take advantage of different things, that's something that is not well understood and well discussed that is latent in what's going on in Title II that worries me in many ways much, much more than us working out the details of last mile interconnection and, and trying to get the lessons of the past of that right. Joel, do you want to weigh in on this? Not on this, but okay. I, I have a mischievous other question. Okay, Man, sure. Uh, it's not really meant to be mischievous. I, it's meant to be serious. But um, you know, the, the reason we have intellectual property protection is to provide adequate incentives to con continue creation of good new stuff. And suppose you had a technological change that radically changed, that reduced the cost of bringing new stuff to market. If you thought you had the right amount of protection before, would you then therefore conclude that you need less protection now? No. <laughs> I knew you'd say that. I figured you might say that. Um, all right then, settled. <laughs> uh, there's a question in the back from our stock analyst. Since we've broached the topic of Title II, <laughs> and maybe this is for you, Christopher, can someone explain to me, as sort of a dumb Wall Street guy, how we can say Title II is not about tariffs and rate regulation, yet I think it's Section 202 and 203 are sort of nestled in there that compels the FCC to to get involved if they deem the prices unjust and unreasonable. I, I'm just confused by that. And I, I, I guess my fear as an equity analyst is that means we now have to rely on some fuzzy judgment of a group of people in a room down here in DC, but it doesn't feel ironclad, which is sort of what Wall Street wants. So. So uh, the, the official answer is the FCC has forborne from certain requirements and insists that they're not going to do that. 
So the first thing is a matter of pure certainty. Anytime you're relying on forbearance tells you that a subsequent commission could change the balance. It's not matter of, it's a matter of discretion and how that happens is, that's one irreducible form of the ambiguity. That's one uh, problem I would see. The second thing is, um, even the, the big demon in Title II has been traditionally cost-based rate making, which is got lots of problems with it about reinforcing, taking the status quo as a baseline, and, and costs are plastic, especially shared costs, which are essentially can allocate it in a number of defensible arbitrary ways, and there's all these ways we can manipulate them. And so the question has always been, how do we get out of that? And there's not a great set of proposals of what we could do otherwise. You know, price caps, ultimately were based originally on a set of cost-based prices, and for all the reasons that, that would cause it to be struck down by the DC circuit as twice as arbitrary and capricious, setting the different rates that calibrate that become very controversial in determining what's exogenous. Setting, even if we could somehow get a new way of resolving interconnection disputes or retail pricing disputes that doesn't, are completely independent of that, I've been watching what's going on in some of the patent disputes where in standard essential patents, they're trying to figure out what is a fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory rate. And this gets my attention as a, util a public utilities guy. Hey, reasonable and non-discriminatory sounds pretty familiar, doesn't it? It's the same set of standards. And what they often don't talk about is they look at someone who's agreed to license on reasonable and non-discriminatory rates. They look at whether they're bargaining in good faith with it. And if someone is a willing licensee, do they have to take it? The worry is that the patent, the, it is much in the literature, is that the patent holder will hold them up. What we're starting to realize is that the incentives for hold up are symmetrical. Is that there's now in the literature showing up something called reverse hold up, and it's epitomized by Apple. Apple takes the position they're not paying a dime to anybody. And they participate in what are conceived as, they meet the minimum standards of good faith negotiation. And then a regulator is put in a position of trying to figure out who's the bad guy here? Who's really not working in good faith? And if you pick up the problem of setting a rate, you basically pick up that choice of trying to referee a dispute between two commercial entities who have differing values, visions of the value of the, what they're bargaining over, and try to adjudicate them in a world where in normal commercial negotiations, deadlock is part of sometimes a negotiation. I mean, it happened with me in my house. I made an offer, she said no, I walked. She came me back two weeks later. I said, will you buy the house? I wasn't playing games, it just wasn't the right number for me. And so what's interesting is you, you then have the symmetrical problem where either side can do that. And if the regulator, I will say, the regulator might set the price perfectly right. If the methodology set up is going to favor one side or the other, if it's not the perfect price, someone has the incentive not to negotiate in good faith and default to, the reg to whatever they're going to get from the dispute resolution mechanism, because that's their second best alternative. And what you've now introduced is, regardless of what the mechanism is, the shadow of whatever the tie-breaking formula is going to be is going to affect the commercial negotiation that used to happen independently. That's what worries me, is in the absence of good tools of figuring out how to set that balance, we are going to interfere with the way that those things are being handled. And if you don't get what you want out of this bargain and dodgeize the whole thing, you'll start partnering with another source just as the studios are now turning to Hulu when they're afraid of Netflix. They're the natural strategic partners. Suppose we regulate Netflix, get their prices down to what we think are fair, and the studios win out of that? We don't get Hulu. And so this is, you know, we have to think about this in a more dynamic way and be realistic about what, how we can, whether we're going to be any good at refereeing these kinds of disputes. And on that note, Stuart tells me that, uh, that we're done here and that we're going to hear from my mother's congressman, Frank Pallone, next, right? No, 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 no. Oh. John, uh, Sal oh, jo oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, great. Okay, thank you very much. Please join me in thanking our panelists. <laughs>